Our Father, we thank you for yet another privilege to come before you to study your word. We are praying that your spirit will take these written words, make them alive in our hearts in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that you help us so that we'll get these principles out of your word and we'll go with them and we'll do what you want us to do. And your work will prosper in our hands. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our study of First Thessalonians, I told you we have five chapters. And because of that, we need to take this extra time in the afternoon to do chapter three. Then later, we'll continue in the mornings. In the other parts of the epistle, the apostle had been talking about what the pastor does, what the pastor preaches, who the pastor is, but then in the chapter in which we are now, he's showing us how the pastor feels for his children, for the members of the congregation. Actually, as Paul the apostle and Silas and Timothy administered in Thessalonica, persecution had driven them away. And Paul then became concerned because of the separation from the Thessalonian believers. He was wondering how they were feeling, how they were fearing, how things were going on with them. He had made some attempt to go back to them, to visit them, know how they do. But that wasn't possible. As we learn in chapter 2, verse 17. But we, brethren, been taken from you for a short time, in presence not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. And you can see the feeling there, you can see the concern there, you can see the thing he wanted to do. But then he was not able to do that. In verse 18, he tells us, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. It was a result, as a result of that, he needed to send somebody down there to find out how they were fearing. And uh, Timothy eventually came back and he brought a good report. It was as a result of that good report that now Paul the Apostle was writing to them. That forms the background of what we're looking at right now we're considering purposeful mission that is the mission of timothy to thessalonica it had a purpose purposeful mission and establishment in holiness there are three points we're going to consider as we look at the chapter number one purposeful mission to suffering christians they had met with persecution and now the mission of timothy there had a goal had a purpose which you'll see as we move on number two powerful motivation from steadfast christians because these christians were steadfastly standing on the truth that became a great motivation for paul the apostle to write to them to minister more unto them and then number three prayerful ministry for sanctifying christians he had a goal, he had a desire that what was lacking in them will be supplied and perfected. He wanted them to be holy, he wanted them to be more of love, he wanted them to be sanctified, and then he began to pray for them. Number one, purposeful mission to suffering Christians. In uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. It says, wherefore. The word wherefore is like the word therefore. And it links you back to the last part of the previous chapter. What we have in the previous chapter in verses 19 and 20. For what's our hope? What's our joy? What's a crown of rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Because for ye are our glory and joy. 
But then, because he wasn't able to see the glory and the joy and the crown of rejoicing, he then had the mind that he will contact them. If he couldn't go directly, he will send a representative. He said, therefore, wherefore, because our minds have been with you, when we could no longer forbear the pain of separation, he felt the intense pain of that separation, he said, we thought it would be all right to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus Timothy, our brother, a minister, minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning the faith. He sent Timothy to them. You want to understand that that wasn't the first time that uh, or the last time that Timothy will be sent to a mission post like that. As we look at the record of the scriptures, Paul the apostle was not able to visit every place he would like to touch. But then he had some lieutenants, he had some assistants, he had some co-laborers or fellow workers that he could send forth. And Timothy happened to be one of the trusted ones in Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 19, it says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus who sent Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. It says, you Philippian believers, I would rather want to come and see you. Because he's been there, you understand, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, he was in prison there. And then he went out of that city again. He had a compassion, he had a concern for them. How were they doing? And he said, I'm going to send Timothy unto you so that I'll be able to know your spiritual state. Then he said in verse 20, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Then he says, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel there's so much there and the spirit of god will have to interpret it to your heart he said it's a trusted man it's a dependable man it's a loyal man it's a faithful man it's a person you can close your two eyes stretch out your hand and say lead me on i trust you because you are trustworthy he says i have no man like-minded like him and i can send him anywhere what i will see he will see what I'll be looking for, he'll be looking for. What I will get, he will get. Exactly what I will see if I went there is what he will come back and give me a report. He's not going to modify the report. He's not going to adulterate the report. He's not going to change the report. He's going to give me exactly what I will be looking for if I were there myself. And therefore I have the joy and I have the confidence and the rest of my peace in my mind. I could send him he'll bring back a good report and then we come back now to first thessalonians chapter 3 you understand now why timothy was sent to them and then he said in verse 3 that no man should be moved by those by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto he was telling them as he wrote to them he said actually there are three reasons why timothy was saying to them number one to inquire number two to encourage number three to establish he sent timothy to them number one to inquire after their spiritual state he wanted to know how they were doing he wanted to know how the gospel was moving on with them to inquire number two to encourage them that's what he said in latter part of verse two to establish you and to comfort you that's what comfort there means to encourage you to lift you up to build you up to charge you so that you'll be able to stand on your feet concerning your faith then he said when he gets to you he'll be telling you that no man none of our members none of our people should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto he had taught them when he was with them that they needed not to be surprised taken unawares because of persecution in fact he had told all the churches he had opportunity of ministering to in acts of the apostles chapter 14 acts 
chapter 14 reading from verse 21 and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they uh, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, con con confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must. There is a must. There is something that is laid upon the believer as well as upon the church. While the church is in an hostile environment or hostile community or hostile world, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god that's why i was telling the thessalonians when timothy gets to you it's going to remind you of exactly what i told you before that no man should be surprised because of these afflictions because you yourselves know you are taught by us you are taught of god you know from experience that we are appointed thereunto in philippians chapter 1 Philippians chapter 1 is still telling the church at Philippi actually they were in the same area of Macedonia he was uh, referring to them in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 29 for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake he said it's not uh, something like an afterthought it's not an accidental thing that you Christians are being persecuted it's part of the deal when you come to the kingdom of God because Israel in Egypt will have persecution so that they will not take root in Egypt because it's the persecution of the children of Israel in the land of Egypt that will make them to understand and to know we are not where we ought to be yet this is not our home if everything was convenient for them in Egypt they will take root they will not understand we have another home and we have another place it was so that their mind will be in Canaan and the same thing with the children of God if the world was totally convenient no persecution no tribulation no trouble and no suffering you will take root there and you will not think and you will not expect and you will not anticipate the coming of the Lord that's why he told them in this verse 29 unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only that you will believe on him but that also you will suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me he assured them he said it's part of the Christian life because he tells us in uh, second Timothy second Timothy chapter 3 reading there from verse 12 here it says yes and all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution therefore understand don't let the devil trouble you don't let the devil deceive you know the lie of the devil the lie of the devil is if this is well god everything will be peaceful it will be prosperity and you will enjoy everything there will be no trouble for the flesh and there will be nothing to concern you at all you'll just be like you are you are going on on a bed of roses into the kingdom of god that's the lie of the devil don't let the devil deceive you because we are not ignorant of his devices because you need to understand god uses those permitted sufferings to strengthen the believer's faith and to build holy character on the other hand satan will take that same thing that god has permitted in his own wisdom and for a particular purpose he'll take those things twist them around to seduce and to deceive believers to go away from the path of righteousness because of the pain of the persecution and the suffering come on to first thessalonians chapter 3 in verse 4 it says for verily when we were with you we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it is come to pass and ye know he said we didn't deceive you you know paul the apostle he gave the whole word to the people that's why he said i am free i'm clean i'm pure from the blood of all men because we have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel 
of God. He told them about the promises. He told them about the problems. He told them about the good things they were going to have. He told them about the persecution, about the suffering they were to have to you. He said, when we were with you, we told you that you should expect all these things. And then in verse 5, it says, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I could no longer forbear the ignorance of uh, not knowing what is happening to you there. I could no longer forbear the pain of separation. How are those little children doing? Because he spent just a few weeks with them. And with the few weeks he spent with them, he has not been able to go back to them again. And there is no epistle that has been reaching to them. And the New Testament has not been complete for them to be reading. And every individual did not have a Bible to read. And there was no apostolic presence in that place because of that no teacher there no pastor there and no matured hand there and the writings of the scriptures were not available to them because of that he was concerned and then he said i sent you know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and then our labor will be in vain so then you understand point number one which is purposeful mission to suffering Christians. Now we go to point number two. Powerful motivation for stead from steadfast Christians. Now, when Timothy got there, Timothy realized that these people, they were standing firm. They were standing on the watch of God. They had not been shaken by their problem. They seemed to even be riding on the wings of their storm. And because of that, Timothy was so encouraged himself. And then Timothy came back and said, Paul, you should have been there yourself. Those people are doing fine. They are steadfast in the faith. They manifest the signs of conversion. And the work is abiding. There is the work of faith. There is the labor of love. There is the patience and perseverance of hope. In fact, their, their conversion is very, very genuine. And I've not seen any other church better than the church of the Thessalonians. It became a powerful motivation for Paul the Apostle. And because of that now, he was going to write unto them. That's now from verse 6. It says, but now... When Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and of your charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly, not just ordinarily, moderately, but greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith for now we live if you stand in the lord he said now we live if you stand in the lord what does that mean it means we'll be so discouraged we'll be so dejected it will be worse than dying if we have labored and it's in vain and everything is scattered and everything is destroyed because of the persecution but he said although there were persecutions and suffering although we were a little bit dejected and almost depressed and we didn't know what we were going to make of life although it appears we are feeling life is being wasted they are persecuting our converse and maybe nothing remains on the field when timothy came back life came into us when he told us those people they are standing it's a worthy church it's a church that is standing on the word of god it's a church that handles the word of god effectively and the word of god has had a great impact on them he said sorrow fled away all our problems went and life came into us we live because you are standing on the word of god that's the greatest thing you can do for a preacher the preacher really if he's a real preacher of the word of god he doesn't need money he doesn't need material things he doesn't need anything but obedience to the word of god show me a preacher that preacher may be going through some problems and then he begins to hear testimonies there's real conversion there there's real sanctification there and those people are standing on the word of god and those people although they are being persecuted the greater the persecution the greater their commitment when you bring that kind of report to a preacher of the word of god he might 
might be low, he might be depressed, he might be dejected, he might be having some problems. When that information comes unto him, it's like you give him injection. He comes high and it appears there is a stimulant there. It appears now we know what we are living for. Something great is happening in the places that we have gone. But you know, if you look at your work and you see that in your work, the people are really not showing evidence of conversion. Those we thought were converted before they are all backsliding and there is unrighteousness and there is no holiness and life is like all those people in the church are like people of the world. That can make a preacher sick. That can make a pastor sick. But what gives him life? What gives him courage? What makes him to feel that I need to keep on living? Is when those reports are coming unto him. Number one, about yourself. What kind of reports are we hearing? Is it the kind of report that will make life come into us? The kind of report that if we were sick, if we had the report about you on the field, we have report about you in your location. When that report comes, sickness even without prayer will vanish away. We live when you stand on the word of God. In your own case too, in your own congregation. What kind of reports will we be hearing? Are you preaching the word to them? And are those people getting converted? And are they having challenging testimonies? That when the testimonies come back to you, you'll be able to say, I don't mind the persecution. I don't mind the affliction. I don't mind the tribulation. I don't mind the suffering. I don't mind all the things I've lost. In fact, consecration then means nothing. You consecrate everything. You are so joyful. You know what you have given your life for. But that's when you are teaching the word of God, faithful to the word, and the fruit is coming like the fruit in the Thessalonian church. And so then in verse 9, it said, For what thanks can we render? unto God again for you for all the joy wherewith with joy for your sakes before our God he was so happy he said how can we express it again did you see his tone exuberance in the tone the joy in the tone the excitement in the tone he said with all the vocabularies I have I lose words to be able to tell you what joy and what gratitude we have unto God because of the report we're hearing about you and so concerning them he added about their faith or standing on the word of God they believed the gospel that he had preached unto them and also he heard about their charity that is they loved God they loved those preachers that had preached to them and they loved the people of God the brethren and then he had a good remembrance they had a good remembrance of the people that had preached unto them they said eh, eh, they, were, they were willing to see you Paul those people every one of them we went here we went there and as we interviewed them interacted with them they said they just wanted to see you they just wanted to see you Paul do you feel lonely in the prison Paul do you feel as if all in Asia Minor they are forsaking you I'm telling you those people in Thessalonica if they could have the means of coming where you are they are so eager to see your face as you are eager to see them that's the thing that brought joy into his heart and that's the joy of ministry for a person that has given his life in preaching to other people I come to point number three prayerful ministry for sanctifying christians now when he had that report that report didn't blindfold him as if they are already perfect and perfected and nothing else remains to be done look at it now in verse 10 in first thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 it says night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith now timothy when he came back yes he had a good report but then he also had the other side of the report he said hey, paul you understand they are okay to the knowledge or to the limit of what they know he said paul they are all right to the limit of the ministry they have received but they are not all right because they still need apostolic ministry and the prophetic touch and the pastoral ministry they still need and the teaching ministry they still need and the evangelistic ministry and touch they still need they are all right in what they have learned 
but because uh, we have not been there there are some things that are lacking there uh, that's somebody that is faithful in giving a report when you are sent somewhere and then you go to that place and you come back you give us a fair report a full report a balanced report that tells us the good things there that also will tell us the things that need perfecting that's why then paul the apostle said the report is good the report is wonderful that doesn't mean everything is all right now but it's acceptable and therefore he told them he was praying for them i want to point out three things to you in that verse in that verse 10 number one is the frequency of his prayer he was praying for them night and day number two is the fervency of the prayer praying for them exceedingly number three is the focus of the prayer what's the focus of the prayer that the lord will prosper away and will be able to come to you and when we get to you we'll be able to perfect that which concerns you that which is lacking in your faith actually that has been uh, the if you read the epistles very well the heart of the apostle paul and i think we need to understand this a pastoral visit is for a purpose apostolic visit is for a purpose but you know many many times and uh, many people do not understand if a person like paul the apostle the preacher the pastor the the teacher if they will visit a place you know what uh, those uh, people will be looking for maybe people are sick there maybe they have some physical problems there or they say he's coming with his apostolic power and authority and all we want him to do will be happy if he will take all the time hundred percent of the time pray for the sick no peter uh, paul was not going to do that he was coming there with apostolic authority to perfect the things that are lacking in their faith and i think we need to learn something to you from that in our church here a state overseer moving on to a region in fact some, sometimes when he gets to that region all the people in the region are expecting is that he'll pray for the sick he will deliver their prayers and he will have revival meetings but he needs to teach he needs to lay line upon line and he needs to perfect the things that are lacking in the face in that region and also when you come over here you come from various various places what's your expectation we're going over there to the headquarters it's like either i come to you or you come to me and it's the same thing you are here now it's like i came to you what are you expecting are you just expecting you know we should entertain you and be merry no we should look at your life and look at your ministry and if there are things that are lacking in your ministry it should be part of the purpose of apostolic visit or pastoral visit to perfect the things that are lacking in your faith look at romans chapter one romans chapter one reading in verse 11 it says for i long to see you that i may impart unto you some spiritual gifts to the end ye may be established that's the purpose if paul was going to go to rome it was not to entertain the people it was not only to pray for the sick it will be that the people will be established and then in second corinthians second corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 15 he told the corinthians why he wanted to come to them and what he thought he'll achieve if he came to them second corinthians 1 15 and in this confidence i was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit you had the first benefit when you were saved but we're hearing stories about the corinthian church that what you got at salvation many of you you are losing that and paul the apostle said i'm coming again i'm not coming to entertain you i'm not coming to make you feel good feel high feel happy i'm coming so that you will have a second benefit in colossians chapter one colossians chapter one verses 28 and 29 here he told the colossians whom we preach warning every man 
teaching every man in all wisdom so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. I think we'll miss a lot and we'll lose a lot if when every time a minister comes into our congregation where we'll tell him now you know our people here they've been discouraged for some time and some of them are running about and uh, they are going to this place that mountain and that valley our people what they need most now is prayer and ministration the supernatural wonders of the lord just lift them up and we're even going to invite other people because some people are going we we'll want to increase our congregation as you are here now that's what we want you to do is that's not biblical paul the apostle said when i come i'm coming for a purpose and the purpose is to perfect the things that are lacking there can you do that without correction can you do that without some warning can you do that without instruction can you do that without teaching can you do that without having some serious sessions to teach the word of god Let's have a change of attitude. I've noticed in many places I go that, uh, you know, the people, the announcement they make, they want to turn me to just an evangelist. He's coming, he'll pray for you, he will do this for you, he'll do that for you. And if I branch off uh, the healing meeting, I branch off uh, deliverance from deliverance and prayer, and I branch into holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And I lay some heavy things on the people there, the leader will be disappointed and unhappy. We thought he will encourage the people. He's talking about treasure institution we thought he'll encourage the people he's talking about one man one wife we thought he's going to encourage the people he's talking about separation from the world we thought he's going to lift up their faith make them happy make them feel high we thought he's going to give them some injection that will kick them and make them running he comes to discourage everybody he's saying that there is no eternal security he's saying that the people that have gone into sin and they have not repented if they died in that condition they'll be going to hell it's discouraged our people we don't know whether we want him to come or not of course you must want him to come that's what we need the lord is coming and these are the last hours of the last days of this generation because of that anything we can say about holiness about preparation for the coming of the lord we shall seriously address the issue in fact if it is not like that we don't need to leave our location here and travel a long distance uh, somewhere and uh, say we're doing anything if we're not going to have chance to perfect what is lacking in your faith let's move on and then he now told them in verse 11 that is first thessalonians chapter 3 verse 11 now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. He's still praying that I'd like to come and visit you. Then he said, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. He knew that they had the love of God because he had spoken about their work of faith. He had spoken about their labor of love. He had spoken about their patience of hope. And then in chapter 4, verse 9 he said but as touching brotherly love ye need not that i write unto you for ye yourselves are taught of god to love one another even though they were doing that well in verse 10 he said indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in macedonia but we beseech you brethren that ye increase more and more and so you you see what he was emphasizing that they will increase in that good thing the love of god in their heart which they've got already and then in verse 13 he said to the end for the purpose that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints here he told the people that the prayer was praying for them is that they'll become unblameable in holiness philippians chapter 2 in philippians chapter 2 reading there in verse 15 
Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 that ye may be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world that is he wanted the Philippian believers to you that if there is anything uppermost anything essential it will be that they will become unblameable and if there is anything the Lord is looking for in your life and in my life it's not only that we're holy not only that we're righteous you become above reproach unblameable in holiness in second peter chapter 3 second peter chapter 3 reading there from verse 10 it says but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness my brothers and sisters read the epistles read the whole bible and you will find the emphasis of those inspired writers is holiness unblameable in holiness that they will be righteous you understand because if in this world only we have hope in christ will be of all men the most miserable if all that our christianity can have is healing and deliverance and prosperity and marriage and children and the mundane things of the world what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul the one thing essential the one thing indispensable follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Paul said it, John said it, Luke said it, everybody said it in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's there too. The essential thing and highway that the Lord Himself has made is called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, it shall be for those the wayfaring men, even though they are fools, they will not hear their name. That's why Jesus Himself said, Blessed are the people in heart only they shall see the lord that's why peter is emphasizing he says in verse 13 nevertheless we are according to his uh, we are according to his promise we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness wherefore beloved seeing that ye look for such things are you looking for such things I said, are you looking for heaven? Are you looking for the coming of the Lord? If you're looking for the coming of the Lord, it says, seeing that you are looking for such things. It says, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. I pray the Lord will do it for us. But have you noticed even in our meeting here, when you talk about healing, do you see how we pray? When you talk about miracle, physical things, do you see how we pray? When I talk about holiness, when we talk about that indispensable thing, without which no man shall see the Lord, when we talk about the essential thing, as if Mary had chosen that thing, which shall not be taken away from her, because that one thing is needful when we talk about that you see how we pray we pray as like under our breath but when we talk about the holy ghost that will quicken your mortal body when we talk about the holy ghost that will live within you and then you will speak in another language and then you'll go to jerusalem you go to judea you go to the uttermost part of the earth and you understand not all that say lord lord shall say the kingdom of god because many will come unto me in that day have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name i've done many wonderful th things many wonderful works and then will i profess unto them i never knew you depart from me ye that walk iniquity when we talk about all those things casting out devils having power speaking a new language you see how we pray when we talk about the most essential thing the thing that we actually need that will transport us from earth unto heaven then we pray as if we do not know how to pray i want you to rise up and saying that the lord is telling us that being unblameable in holiness being holy before the lord holy in the heart holy in the mind holy in our language holy in our interaction holy everywhere holy within and holy without pure within and pure without the one essential thing holiness before god all the days of our life the ticket the passport 
the ticket that will take you to heaven the visa that you need that will take you to heaven when god will look at your heart when god will look at your motive when god will look at everything about you and he will say the heart is clean the mind is clean the spirit is clean the language is clean the interaction is clean the relationship is all right the thoughts are all right it's life is all right the ticket the thing that the lord is looking for being unblameable in holiness that's the essential thing that's the essential thing that's the thing we pray for until we lose our voice that's the thing we pray for and then we almost become unconscious because we're we're, we're expecting the coming of the lord and that is the thing that will transport you from us unto glory open up your heart open up your mind open up your mouth and talk to the lord that he will make you holy not only ordinarily holy he'll make you unblameable in holiness